Hello and welcome back to OT Podcast. We're here to talk about watch your time and how to spend it. My name is Andy Green. Uh, this is Philip Shots. The one and only. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm pretty good. I've just come off, uh, it's a Sunday when we're recording this. Just been hanging out with family, playing some Mario Kart. Haven't been playing any uh, rugby by any chance? Uh, no, don't have the backyard for it. There's lots of nice parks nearby. I'm sure you yeah, can find something. Yeah, that's true. But do you know who uh, has been playing rugby? Potentially today's guest. Tell me about it, Andy. Sarah Hrini. She is the captain of the Black Ferns, which is the New Zealand rugby team, and also a Tudor ambassador, Felix. Boom. Double whammy. And a, uh, speaking of double whammies, I think she's got two gold medals, two Olympic gold medals. Yeah, yeah. Really solid performer. Lovely, lovely human being. Real, uh, real treat to chat to Sarah, mm, i got to say. Yeah, Pretty we cool. Get, we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, mm. Andy Green, as you know, uh-huh. uh, as anyone that's been listening to the last few weeks knows, uh, <laughs> I've been mad into succession. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's, it's getting deeper. I'm halfway through season two now. I uh, still hate everyone. But yep. I was Good. watching it and uh, my partner pulled up on YouTube a documentary from 2003 called Born Rich. Uh-huh. Tell me about it. And this, I don't know if you recall 2003, it was the era of Gossip Girl Part 1, the first time around. Yes. And I have a sneaking feeling that Gossip Girl was based largely on this documentary. Uh-huh. Uh, it is was created by a guy named Jamie Johnson, who's an heir to the Johnson & Johnson fortune. Uh, it was mm-hmm. filmed between 99 and 2001, and it consists mostly, it, it, it feels to me like a university media studies project. Love it. Um, and it's him interviewing 10 other young wealthy people. And it's sort of the premise of it is he's coming into like a, his family inheritance around his 21st birthday. And he's like talking about his 21st birthday party with the caveat that, you know, like he's going to have access to tens of millions of dollars, you know, wild, essentially Absolutely wild. infinite money. And the other people he talks to are similarly nuts. We've got uh, Georgina Bloomberg, who's um, uh-huh. heir to New York City mayor and media guy, Michael Bloomberg. Uh, the exceptional Josiah Chesterton, Cheston Hornblower, who is a heir to the Vanderbilt and Whitney families. He was- Horatio's v- grandson. <laughs> Nice, nice one blow reference. He was, uh, he's actually was, was very um, with it. Like uh-huh. and he sort of seemed to have some sort of sense of his ridiculousness in the world. There's uh, Jamie, Jamie Johnson's a host. Cy Newhouse the fourth, who's a Condé Nast heir. Uh, and Cy is short for Samuel Irving, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was into fencing and he was nuts. Ivanka Trump, who, as you will be aware, uh, is a daughter of Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, Benjamin Weil, who was basically uh, gambling money. Um, and he he was, seems, you know, at, at the risk of defamation, uh, like a terrible human being. <laughs> um, and the risk of defamation is real because halfway through he, like, sued Jamie Johnson for making it, like saying that it was like defa- you know, putting him in a bad light. And also there's a bunch of other guys, but also shout out to Carlo von Zetschel, who was Kaiser Wilhelm II's great-grandson. Um, mm. It was nuts. Like imagine back to like being, you know, in, in year 12 or whatever, but also being able to do whatever you wanted in the world. Like, you, you know, yeah. the sense of normal was like, I'll just buy this eighty thousand dollar horse. Or yeah, you just, you, I crashed my car. I'll just buy a new one. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, and like some of the stuff they do sort of talk about is is you know insane, but other parts of it, like I think there's some. It's easy to sort of like look at it as you know, wow, the one percent. But there mm-hmm. is also some genuine like soul searching and like awareness with these people of like what a weird position it is to be in. Um which comes back to, you know, what I, I think I was talking to you about, how, how I like in succession. It's like they're all horrible people, but there's occasional glimpses of them as humans. I think that's the whole point of that show, though. Yeah, but it's, it's, it is, and uh, that's what sort of came across them. in this. Like it's, it's easy to make them caricatures and, and hate them, but then they're also products of mm. like this ins- insane system and institution and, and all this sort of this sort of stuff, which is um, – yeah, it's on YouTube, like I said, so we'll put the link up, uh, you know, two hours and, you know, it's worth a watch, I think. 
Love it. Love it. Good recommendation, Felix. Mm. I've got another recommendation, Andy, if you'll um, if you'll dual, humor me. Dual recommendation, huh? Yeah, doubling it up. Uh, well, this is yeah. more watch-related. Um, there is an article in the New York Times by the exceptional Victoria Gamelski, and it is on the friend Instagram being a watch brand's best friend. Uh-huh. Did you uh-huh. see we this? Need to get, we, I did. We need to get Victoria on. We should. Yeah, um, we should. She constantly writes exceptional articles in the New York mm. Times uh, on watches, and that seems like something I'd like to find out more about. But so this, a little quote um, that I find interesting. It talks about, you know, obviously the, the collecting culture, but also the, the impact that Instagram has on brands directly, like on their sales and their development and design. Um, uh-huh. The degree to which the photo sharing app shapes design, however, is a delicate subject. Bound by centuries of heritage, most watchmakers insist that what happens or doesn't happen on the app has no bearing on the look and feel of their products. Hmm. Do you buy that, Andy? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like even then later on, they had this uh, quote from Chris Granger Hare, and he was saying, look, he sort of, for a joke, he sort of put this prototype up saying, hey, if I get, you know, 50 deposits will make it and he had like 250 within you know a short amount of time that's what you get he's got a he's got a pretty big following so it's uh it's what you get how do you what do you think about the impact of instagram on watches andy oh undeniable it's changed demand for sure uh you know watch i gen, as a general i think the watches that photograph well have become more popular i think that's why the speedmaster is so popular i've said it before mm. uh, at me um I think that, yeah, certain still sports watches that, you know, look really nice, like getting a watch to post to Instagram is certainly a thing. Like yeah. it's the whole new watch alert, people showing what they get. That's probably driven up consumerism in a sense. And who did we talk to? Was it was it, um, was it Cat from 10 and 2 that like, and I, I'm feeling this more and more, like you're getting a new watch and you just deliberately don't post it? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm trying to fight back on that sort of that dopamine hit. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 100%. I mean, yeah, we've both got watches we've not posted um, mm. because who cares? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's certainly changed the the popularity of watches and that popularity and demand has certainly changed the watch industry, right, because brands are going to start making things. I mean, yeah. look, there was a bloody Speedmaster, Speedy Tuesday. How are you going to yeah. tell me that it hasn't when there's a, <laughs> been, what, two limited edition watches after a hash, hashtag? Yeah, I mean, well, Twitter has hashtags too. Yeah, um, okay, but like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, I think the, the the main thing that I sort of, and this is it's it's not solely Instagram, but like Instagram is a huge driver in it. Is that sort of the development of that like homogenous global collection of cool watches, mm. like sports Rolex, AP, Pat? Like, there's a like there's a handful of watches that will be cool anywhere in the world, no matter like if you find someone interested in watches in you know. Abu Dhabi or, you know, Minsk, mm. it's going to be the same cool watches. Whereas I think before that would have, you know, there would have been a bit more regional difference and a bit more, you know, like not everyone was on the same foot discovery-wise. Like there'd be guys that like only read print magazines and there'd be guys that just had a bunch of rich mate and, you know, new boutique owners. Like whereas now everyone is coming at this space this through Instagram. It's interesting, actually. Like every now and then, like we definitely hit that fatigue, oh. and every now and then, I f- you find an account that I guess gives like reignites like a spark of hope into beyond just like the sports models that everyone wants. Yeah. One very recently, which I it's not on my list of recommendations, <gasps> but I've been meaning to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. is a guy uh, whose handle is watches dot of dot espionage, former CIA oh, yeah. officer. Have you seen this guy? Yeah, he's been. Um... He might. I don't know if he's been on Hodinky, but he's yeah. He's been quoted. Cole Pennington and like, yeah. shared something, yeah. and that's how I found him. I think he shared a story. Well, let's get him um, on. Let's. Um, maybe he's not allowed to talk. Maybe he'll have to he do distort it. Yeah. You know, that's sort of, my name is Agent Twelve. Um, but I CIA, other- like, and just posting his gear. And to me, this is like sorry to cut you off, but like this is no, found, this is like a really interesting look at a different perspective on watches like i'm not super into like the military stuff but it's still yeah. interesting to kind of see you know he'll post like i think he posted something that was like his daily you know everyday carry for when he was touring iraq or something it was on like a secret mission and it's sort of like it's really interesting to compare it to something like what you would see in a movie well write that in the notes andy because otherwise i'm going to forget about it um watch watches of espionage if you type that into instagram 
I'm not, no, I'm, I'm asking you to do it because uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> because I'm going to talk about um, how I think this like the inst- that I think one of the follow on effects from that sort of homogenous or that you know making everything more global means that there's we're seeing far more uh, safe choices from watch brands and like mm. there's I think there's sort of like it said you know Victoria in the article sort of says. I think it's actually a quote from Stephen Pulverant where it's like, okay, so if watch brands know they can sell a blue dial integrated sports watch, they're going to make it. Like, why would they not? Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think that's, you know, the, the the risk there is, the good thing is everyone gets, you know, a watch they want, like whether you, you want that AP look for a Timex price, there's, you know, there's a Timex, there's a Tissot, there's, you know, a whole range of options. But the risk is you're not, you're going to lose innovation because it's just a big echo chamber and you're not going to get those interesting outside voices. But I don't know. This is Instagram's one of those sort of constant uh, talking points along with, you know, hype steel watches. We can just talk about Instagram every, every week and still never yeah. come anywhere on it. But <laughs> what have you been into, Andy? What's on uh, your wrist? If I, I don't think I've seen it on the gram. Yes, I, I posted a reel of uh, of one of these watches came what out. What's the engagement weeks ago. like? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, Rado Captain Cook by by metal pieces. So there's the well by color, I should say. Uh, so there's like sort of like a yellow, uh, yellow and steel, and kind of rose gold and steel. Uh, look, have you seen these Captain Cook models, Felix? I have. I've seen. Uh, I don't think I've seen these specific two tone guys, but I'm familiar with the Captain Cook. Captain uh, Cook, it's been around for probably, what, four or five years now? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been around since the 60s, but, but you know. But the, the reissue, I should say. Yeah. 42 millimeter case, um, which is a bit chonk, if I'm honest. It's just a bit too big um, for me anyway. Yep. But it is a, uh, yeah, so they've got the bimetal colors, 3500 bucks Australian, which is, you know, really it's a solid good. price. Really good considering what you get. Uh, yeah. for 80 hour power reserve, obviously, you know, it's Rado, so it's that, more or less that. in-house. Yep. Uh, 300 meter water resistance, obviously on a bracelet, um, a lot of engraving on the on the clasp and on the case back. Uh, overall, it's like a nice looking watch yeah. and really well priced. Um, Are the bezels still uh, concave? Yes. How do you yes, fit, how do you find those? Well, it looks cool with the domed crystal. Um, yeah. I kind of like a concave into a dome. A dome, it's sort of one of my personal favorites. Really? What I don't, yeah. If I'm gonna be honest, we're gonna be a little bit spicy with a take here. Yeah. The press picks don't look anything like the watch. Really? It's, 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 do you mean like the renders or the like lifestyle sh- shots? The lifestyle shots. What do you mean? Well, how, it doesn't look that nice in person. It's been a bit too long on Photoshop, have they? I, just, I don't know. It's just <laughs> Honestly, though, you can say that about any watch. You can, but this is one where it's, it, it jars me a little bit when I look okay. at the... Uh, the, the Expectation the, did not meet reality. Not, not quite. Um, and yeah, I get, I get why you would make it look as nice as it looks. Sure, but, sure. Um, it's just my spicy take. But yeah, great watch nonetheless. Um, just you know, I'll post, I mean, I'll and post look, more. it's still solid value. Three and a half k for you know a pretty sort of dressy. Yeah, you know, dressy Hard modern watch, driver. Purpose built. Um, yeah, high quality. Like it's Rado. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, Rado. Um, I think they're a cool brand, and I think this is a um, it's it's an interesting design. But uh, would you go yellow or rose gold? Uh, probably the rose. In this rose. one, yeah, that's the the, the, the yellow uh, beads of rice center links. Are pretty, pretty yellow, huh? Pretty yellow, yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty vintage, vintage. Mm-hmm. Pretty, <laughs> um, yep, pretty eighties. Uh, you know, I'll throw a um, I'll throw another recommendation out there as well. Which Oof. free guy? Um, oh yeah, uh, Ryan Ryan Reynolds. I've free seen guy. that. Oh, I saw it with my kid actually. I don't know if that was oh, really. A, yeah, man. This is, a, is it appropriate for a seven year old. <laughs> nah, it's fine. It's video games. It's the future. <laughs> Pretty pretty cool movie. Yeah, it was a kind of a cool premise, wasn't it? Sort of like yeah. The Matrix, but you know, sort of like a new it's premise. Fortnite. Sort of like a new premise. You know what I mean? Like that didn't exist. Uh, yeah, it's really hard to come up with original stories or something that hasn't been told before. Or premise Do you th- seen. Oh, I've got a hot take conspiracy theory. Uh-huh. Do you think Free Guy was sponsored or was timed? The release was timed to tie in with Facebook's rebranding. Uh... The meta, metaverse. Yeah. That's what the free guys, the metaverse, you know. Oh, God, I don't want to think about the metaverse, Felix. <sighs> anyway, yeah, let's not. Yeah, no, free guys, great. Uh, any other news before I get on to my little, the 
the, the, the watch that's burning a hole on my wrist? Uh, no, I think we need to talk about uh, the watch that is burning a <laughs> metaphorical hole on your wrist. <laughs> Can you burn a hole on your wrist? Well, I think if any watch could do that, Andy, it would be a mm. G-Shock. Uh, and if, if, it, if it did burn a hole on your wrist, it would survive because it's, you know, famously tough. As you know, Andy, this, this episode is being brought to you by G-Shock. Thank you, G-Shock. And I have been wearing the GM 2100-1A. Ooh. Which, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, essentially like the the metal Casio. Yes, released fairly recently. Yeah, a couple of months ago, I think. And this one is the uh, so steel sort of outer case with that carbon core uh, inner, mm-hmm. with a sort of a quite a muted and moody like silver dial. It's four hundred ninety nine Aussie. Uh, check it out, gshock.com.au. There's a few things that I like about this compared to the regular plastic Casio that I've got. Okay. Well, we've got, yeah, we both have Casio. So, yeah. So I was, uh, yeah, I wasn't quite sure where to, you know, like the comparison. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be the same, same. Turns out it's not. One of the things that I'm most taken by, Andy, is the strap. Yes. It's textured. It's got like this sort of mm-hmm. little fine grid uh, pattern. And it's also quite sort of, uh, stiff, like it's not a, a soft rubber strap. It sort of really holds its shape, uh, which kind of gives it almost a bracelet-y fe- feeling. Mm. Um, and it just plays really well with the with the metal head of the watch, and it gives it a you know a bit of bit of weight, bit of rigidity, bit of texture. All these sort of things I find, you know, tactile and pleasing in a watch, and very different from that all plastic, almost sort of I'm going to say you, you know. Uh, it feels more premium. I guess that's the way mm. to, that's the way to say it. And it's also like surprisingly moody. I think mm. I was I was thought, oh yeah, it's going to be like a silver watch, silver dial, you know, Casio. I know what I'm getting, but up close, it's the dial crystal. I think is actually tinted like a sort of a soft grey, mm. and the grain. There's a sort of a vertical, vertical, vertical brush on the dial, and there's depth. And that sort of even the loom looks like dark grey underneath the crystal. So it's really, I don't know, it's quite sophisticated for for my um, you know sort of take on it. And it's it's just been a joy. Like it's a bit more. It feels less like a you know a watch you go to the gym in, and more mm. of a just a you know casual all rounder. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think he's way about eighty grams, so yeah. you're definitely getting a significant amount more weight, which you know is going to play into that the, yeah, the luxuriousness yeah. of it. And it's sort of it's between like I've used the, the the full metal before, so it's not quite that, and you get that a slightly top heavy mm. sort of feel, which you know definitely you know it, it feels I don't know premium is the word I'm going to go with. I've sort of said it mm. before, but I think it's it's appropriate given the you know the positioning of this watch in their lineup. But Andy, I was checking out the website uh, mm-hmm. again, gshock.com.au, and I found something that I think we need to have in our lives. And what's that? There are two watches: uh-huh. the GM twenty one hundred CH and the GMS twenty one hundred CH. Okay. The GMS is a slightly smaller version. It's a Christmas themed couples pair of watches. Oh, let's make this happen. So they look. So the one, the 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 twenty one hundred CH. Looks essentially the same as the one I've got, uh-huh. but it's got green text. It's got red hour markers, and it's got gold hands for a real festive feel, Andy. Oh, Felix, you need to link this. I'm trying to find it. Yeah, Christmas. Okay, so CH is obviously Christmas, not uh, not Switzerland. <laughs> no, no, Casio would not like to be associated with uh, the country code of CH. But that that is a cool little thing. That's a little 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 festive drop, and that's the sort of uh, nimbleness we expect from uh, from Casio. Yeah. But anyway, that's my that's my take. Do you got any questions about this watch, Andy, or shall we uh, take it on to the next level? Well, no, Felix. I think you've uh, you've explained yours to me perfectly. I think it's time to get back to the uh, the main purpose of today's episode. Sure, let's do it. All righty, Felix. Well, let's get Sarah Hrini, captain of the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, Black on Ferns. the line. Black Ferns. Black Ferns on the line. Uh, Alrighty, let's do it. Andy, today's guest is a remarkable athlete, a two-time Olympian who carried the New Zealand flag into the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Stadium. She's a World Cup winning rugby player and captain of the Black Ferns. She's also 
a Tudor ambassador. Welcome to the podcast, Sarah Harini. How are you? Good, good. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. You're our first Tudor ambassador to come on the show, which is a, a very big deal and something we'll we'll talk to in a minute. So we'll get the rugby chat out the way. Rugby Sevens was introduced at the Rio Games uh, where you won silver and then you backed it up with that gold at Tokyo famously. Um, what's it like to play in new sports at the Olympics and how much different is it to sort of a regular Black Fans game? Um, yeah, playing at the Olympics was was amazing. Um, pretty special back in 2016 and we were very fortunate that uh, because of the Olympics that the Women's Sevens team was actually formed. So um, yeah, fortunate for me that my career started because of that. Um, and then, yeah, just playing at the Games, obviously something that only happens every four years. It's the pinnacle of pretty much every sport around the world. So it was really scary. Um, there was a lot of preparation done for it, but I suppose since 2016 to now has been, yeah, it's been pretty, um, pretty, pretty a special time for for me and my team, and uh, fortunate enough to bring home a gold medal for New Zealand as well. So, yeah, that's that's pretty great. But it's not just uh, women's rugby that's sort of getting some some well deserved attention over here in Australia. We've got the um, women's AFL, which is you know mm-hmm. kicking goals, all puns intended. <laughs> And over in the States, you're seeing sort of high-profile players like Mig and Rapineau really, you know, sort of propelling, you know, that, that top-tier level of, of female athletes into the spotlight for, you know, you know what seems to be a, a long time overdue. Why do you think that's happening now? And, and what do you think needs to happen to keep that sort of uh, focus and momentum happening on, on women's sports? I think now, um, like us as females, uh, professional sports people, we want girls to be able, to, young girls to be able to see us. So the more we actually stand up, uh, promote ourselves on social media, promote the team, um, actually voice our opinions on things, I think that's when voices get heard and things start to, start to get changed. And we've obviously noticed that over the last few years. So I think it's really important that us in the programs um, and us in the sport are able to do that. Um, and it just means that a lot more young kids want to or see that there's a career option, um, that there's possibilities to be able to become professional um, sports people, which is, yeah, it's amazing. And I think that the more that that can grow, it just continues to build momentum. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think there's a lot, still a long way to go, but um, it's definitely changed in the last nine years that I've been involved in professional sport. Yeah, I think um, that's, you know, I, I think that visibility is such a, a huge thing and this is not um, related to it at all and it's slightly different, but I was listening to uh, an interview with uh, Gina Davis, I think, about women's archery and the, there were some really, really phenomenal stats around the uptake of, you know, getting women involved in professional sports in that, like immediately following the Hunger Games, like coming out. So I think that thing of visibility is such a real tangible change. So, you know, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more rugby players down here, you know, soon, hopefully, and all over the world. Yeah, I hope so. I think um, sport, like for me, brings people together. The the games, the Olympic Games, were so awesome for what's happening at the world at the moment. And um, like, if you can bring some positivity to people's lives um, to make people smile, I think it's a win win for everyone. I love that. And Felix, props for bringing in the Hunger Games to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Every conversation, I try to bring <laughs> the Hunger Games into it in some way or another. <laughs> I didn't know where that was going when you said it's un- entirely unrelated. But um, <laughs> so we, I got the press release. Felix got this press release from Tudor, and uh, you know, in a, announcing um, you, know, you being the ambassador for the for the brand, which is which is very Im- impressive. And I think you know, I just said you're the only female, you're the only ambassador we've met from Tudor or spoken to. But I think you're the second female ambassador after Lady Gaga um, <laughs> for the brand, which is it's it's really some solid company. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Their motto is born to dare. I'm curious to hear how you kind of live that spirit kind of every day and what you think of it and how that kind of fits into your life. Yeah, I don't I don't think using mine and Lady Gaga's name in the same sentence is um on the same same level, but I'll take that. Um, the for me, yeah, born to dare is like like pretty I suppose pretty close to my heart. Like uh, it being a female um who plays rugby 
um, who's now a professional athlete, is like we've had to born to want to do things. We've had to um, like we've had to dare to try and overstep the stereotypes of playing rugby as a female, and we've had to try and break down quite a few barriers. So for me, that's like really special. And then for them to be aligned with women's rugby, I think that means a lot more to me than than me being an ambassador. Like. Um, the amount of support um, that they've showed to to women's sport to that are helping out or sorry sponsoring the um, two World Cups next year for sevens and fifteen. So for me, seeing that like that makes me want to then align with such a an amazing brand and um, yeah, obviously um, got an amazing tagline as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and. <sighs> Again, sorry, I'm just, I'm all over the shop, guys. But one of my, I've just remembered one of my favourite Olympic uh, <laughs> moments uh, was was uh, was a rugby moment. It was uh, a fairly incredible and very short post-match interview that your teammate, uh, Ruby Tui, mm-hmm. uh, I think gave after the, the match, I think it was with Russia, um, that went a little bit viral. And it sort of, to me, it summed up that both the Olympic spirit of, of positivity and sort of, you know, coming together from across the world to, to play, but also uh, really represented why New Zealand sporting teams in particular are so loved. What is it about that attitude that, that um, you know, you guys seem to be able to foster? <laughs> to be honest, no one can do an interview like Ruby Tui does. It's, <laughs> it's all on her and she is absolutely amazing at it as well. And um, Yeah, after the interview, I was like, holy, you're a pretty big star now, eh? and it's not even to do with rugby. Um, but like, I suppose for us as Kiwis, and I think it was especially for the Blackburn Sevens team, the, the five years leading into that games was, um, we talked a lot about like, having a good culture and it's like it's a loose term it can easily be thrown around about cultures and teams or in businesses or with people but for us it was actually about like we're all different we come from completely different backgrounds a lot of us come from um pretty hard upbringings where like not there wasn't necessarily food on the table or we came from very small rural backgrounds so to be able to bring characters like that together all into a room to to try and create relationships with each other um, to then achieve a common goal. Like that was our goal over the last five years um, and to leave mana. So to, and, and that was driven from our coaching staff. So when players like that actually express themselves exactly, that's Ruby Tui, that like that's, she wasn't putting on an act. That's her every single day. Um, and for that to be portrayed and shown to the rest of the world and for people to pick up on that, I'm like, that's that makes me really happy. It makes means that people who want to come into our team uh, know that when they come in, they'll be able to be themselves and um, you won't get judged because of that. Yeah, I love that. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, amazing, amazing sentiment. Uh, all right, so I want to talk to you a little bit about watches and a little bit about time. Obviously, you know, you've got this new, new role as ambassador. Um, Rugby sevens is a bit of a shorter game than a traditional rugby match, so time is a little bit more important. But I'm curious to hear uh, what your experience and relationship was with watches um, before this came along. Was it something that you were interested in, or did the tutor sort of uh, did tutor watch sponsoring the the team um, drive that for you? Like, how did it come about for you? So I've always had a watch, um, and mm-hmm. probably more so a sporting watch because always needed a stopwatch. I um, always need something to time myself to do running and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I always had some, this like something like that until like my twenty first birthday, when um, which yeah, it was a long time ago now. But um, my sister and brother got me a really nice um, gold watch engraved with my name on it. So yeah. like it was always quite important to have um, a nice piece when I went out, and then since obviously signing of Tudor and seeing the, the absolute um, class pieces that they uh, bring out has been really special and obviously taken probably a lot more time to appreciate a watch um, what they what what it involves how they work and and things like that so definitely am learning um, mm-hmm. I don't know everything yet but uh, it's been yeah really awesome to work with the team around um, what a watch actually, actually signifies. Yeah, that's awesome. And you've been wearing the the Black Bay Fifty Eight, I believe, in the ninety five silver model. Yeah, is that correct. So, what I mean, as someone who's who's kind of new to taking watches a little bit more seriously, what do you think of it? What do you like about it? What 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 uh, what, what puts a smile on your face when you kind of put it on? Oh, it's amazing. Like, um, 
it's just to be able to like wear it around um it's comfy uh so it suits my wrist quite well mm-hmm. um and just like it's it's a beautiful piece to look at um mm-hmm. and it's probably for me one of the most important things is wearing it around feeling comfortable in it um and to be honest i've had a lot of people comment on on it um and a lot of people who enjoy seeing nice watches so um asking where i got it from um and and stuff like that but yeah it's it's a it's a really nice piece and to be out and then obviously talking with tudor and stuff like that around um maybe getting something else as well so it's Oh, to be honest, it's pretty surreal. Like I didn't even think to that I would wear something like this on my wrist. Um, so to be partnered with a brand like this is, um, yeah, it's actually pretty crazy. That's amazing. And yes, as, as as you kind of indicated, it's a pretty it's a pretty hot watch. You know, re- released this year um, in the ninety five silver, uh, and it's the sort of piece that definitely would get some comments from uh, watch lovers, the people that listen to our show. Definitely would notice that, uh, and and try and spark up spark up a conversation i should say what's that like kind of experiencing um you know this 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 phenomenon of, of people out in the wild kind of complimenting on your watch because it's, it's normal for felix and i and it's something that we we do and people stare but is what's that like as someone who's sort of it's totally foreign to them oh it's like it's pretty crazy and i think probably the most um like thing about it was when we got into my team and mm. i've obviously heard i've signed with tudor and we've done a few um like we do some promos with them if we're mm-hmm. going on tour and, and whatnot so when like i showed them the watch and when they then see that i'm signed with them they're like like <laughs> kind of turn their head like what um but it's like for me being from a small region and a small town um like I, I only dreamed of playing sport for my country i didn't dream of um like getting big sponsorship deals and things that are like especially partnering with a global company I think that to me is really special and it's just helped grow the profile or help grow the profile of our team of our sport um and then hopefully I suppose one day we'll show that um to the younger girls coming into our team that it's like possible to be able to partner with uh, global companies and um create really good relationships with different people so yeah I'm, I'm obviously really stoked with the the partnership but to be able to have a, a watch to wear around that signifies that is um yeah pretty special too amazing and so we said it said it a few times it's it's and felix and i discussed this sort of when when we got the the email um announcing the ambassadorship but it is it is literally you know lady gaga who's been uh, the female ambassador for i think probably two or three years now and then yourself added to it which is which is truly incredible uh because what great company to be in. I'm really curious to hear, and a lot of the kind of your answers that you've had so far are indicative of it, but what do you, like, where where do you want to take this born to dare spirit that kind of aligns with Judah and with, um, you know, with the with the rugby team? Like, what's your what's your goals and dreams for that in terms of driving, um, you know, females in sport? Oh, for me, it's about making our team, the Black Fern Sevens, um, one of the, like, I suppose, uh, the biggest team in the world. I, I've feel like our success has, has shown that, but I want it to be um, a brand that is talked about by everyone around the world. I think that's really important. Um, and, and not just because of the things that we're winning, but I suppose like Ruby's interview, it shows the characters that we have in our team. Um, we hold pretty true values to ourselves about being genuine people. Um, and then with that comes inspiring all these young girls to want to pick up sport, to keep active. Um, doesn't even have to be to do with rugby. It just shows that, um, like, if you're passionate about something and if you love it, then you can achieve success. And so, yeah, for me, about, um, yeah, born to dare to be able to, I suppose, change, make change in the world would be pretty pretty special for me. Yeah, that's... Um that's that's a that's a pretty good goal to be honest i don't think you can get sort of much more important than that um with what you're doing but to take sort of andy's question and to to twist it a little bit so that's that's where you sort of want to be heading where are you going to be like uh in the next year or so so you've got like all these uh new fans based off the olympics and this, you know, sort of a little bit of a spotlight on you guys at the moment. Where can people see you playing in, in the future? What are the next sort of main fixtures coming up? So next year's a big year for sevens and fifteens. Um, and obviously I hope to be a part of it all, but we've got a new elite uh, women's comp starting in New Zealand. So it's like the super rugby teams um, mm. for fifteens. Then there's a sevens Commonwealth Games, a sevens World Cup. 
and a 15s World Cup in New Zealand. So Oof, everywhere, four, you're going to be then, everywhere. Yeah, and then a World Series tournament, and that's from in New Zealand to France to Canada to um, South Africa to Birmingham back to New Zealand. So we will be literally all across the globe next year. Well, hopefully, if I make these teams. Um, but that's like what I talked about to be able to like we are a global sport so people can see us in different parts of the world different time zones and um which is obviously pretty important for what i want to achieve in this i love that all right we've got an elite athlete on the line felix i'm gonna take mm-hmm. the opportunity to ask what what don't they tell you what do you wish you knew uh, about being a pro- professional athlete um you know when you were a young young kid um knowing what you know now um uh Probably the, like, or one of them definitely would be like the highs and lows of social media. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably been, I've been obviously pretty lucky. It's, I've kind of tried to grow with it. Um, but probably a big thing, and especially around females, um, mm-hmm. is actually about like the menstrual cycle um, and things like that and the impact that could potentially have on you having kids later on in life. So obviously, um, like, maybe in a couple of years maybe thinking of doing that but I've probably in the the last six months learned a lot about that um Mm. my menstrual cycle versus I probably should have known this when I was 16 um Mm. so I think that's probably been um one of my biggest learnings is becoming a professional athlete being a female and something that I hope to be able to help uh young girls coming in because I think they're obviously really important when we want to start having families yeah amazing Amazing. Well, it's a good answer. And it's, it's just fascinating because it's sort of, I always like to take these opportunities here yeah, to ask, what, what have you learned? What do you, what do you wish you knew? Um, all right, second, second quick fire question before Felix asks for some recommendations. What's your favorite thing about uh, your job? Everything. Can I say everything? No, um, no you have to be specific. <laughs> oh, I'm like 100%. It was just will be the reason I carry on playing is the people I've got to meet. Nice. Like hands down, best friends in the team. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about it's all about the people you work with, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's a really good spot to uh, to edit on. And so m- maybe it's um, you know typically at the end of our you know interviews we ask someone for their recommendations, uh, and and usually it's uh, we have to say it can't be about watches, but with you, I want a recommendation that isn't about rugby. Sarah, do you, can you uh, come up with maybe a, a book, uh, something you've been listening to, something you've been watching? Netflix, yeah, albums, music. I'm going to say, just because I recently finished the audio book of it, um, mm-hmm. and actually I probably will say this again because my husband finished the book and he absolutely loved it, it's the Matthew McConaughey Green Light book. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's good? It, it really, really good. Um, yeah, and it was obviously it's an autobiography, but... It actually, for me, was probably more of a motivational book slash funny slash just everything. And I, yeah, and for me and my husband to like it was, I think, then obviously will be for a big audience. So yeah, I'm going to say the green light Matthew McConaughey book. That's good solid. Read. Really good read. That's a solid cool. recommendation. I'm going to get on that. All right. All right. All right. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sarah, it's been an absolute uh, honour chatting to you and congratulations uh, both on your recent wins and uh, the the win of becoming, you know, one of Tudor's very few ambassadors. And thank you so much for, for taking the time to chat to us and, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. That was an amazing chat uh, with Sarah. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us. Um, yeah. You know, can't wait to see where the Black Ferns go next. Andy, you've looked up those Christmas watches now, haven't you? I have, yes. What do you think? Love it. I think we're definitely going to have to put an order in. Uh, ho, the pre-order, four ninety nine. dollars gshock.com.au. Uh, nice. And yeah, thank you Check again, G-Shock, for, for sponsoring the episode. Um, yeah, love it. Yeah. Uh, if you want to come at us regarding, uh, you know, Born Rich, if you're that guy mm. that sued people that I defamed earlier, um, please, you can email us at otthepodcast at gmail.com. Our lawyers will respond forthwith. Yes. Uh, you could serve us on Instagram via ot.podcast. Uh, you could also, I don't know, 
do some sort of stuff like liking, subscribing, telling your friend, telling your rich friends. Yeah, if you the best way to like really agitate us if you are trying to start a lawsuit, um, yeah. John, Jamie Johnson, is to leave a five star review on iTunes. Yes, <laughs> just, yes, we'll see that. We'll yep. see that. Yep. Uh, Ivanka Trump, if you want to tell your your immediate family to listen to OT the podcast, actually, that's maybe not the best choice. Um, just some Instagram stories, guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you again. Uh, thank you again, G Shop Australia, for sponsoring the show. We'll see you guys next week. Boom. Oh.